Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Max. And you gotta stand over there. Yeah, we have some um, issue. <laughs> it's okay, we'll just keep ourselves. Why don't you introduce apart. yourself? Sure, my, my name is Tony Barry, and that's Max. And we're having feedback in our microphones. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit today about approachable color workflows. So approachable color workflows meaning you know, we can do stuff with all these fancy cameras and then make it nice and easy for somebody that's on the editorial side versus somebody who's a colorist. So if you find that you're either owner operator, you have your own camera and you want to edit, or you're the person that now the producer throws the color work on you, we can make that a little bit easier for you. So we're going to, today we'll do some storytelling and I guess Max has to be yeah. uh, a foot, uh, a few feet away from me. Exactly. So, and, and that's what's nice, because if you have Max on One subscriptions, you have the access to Magic Bullet Suite. So Magic Bullet Suite run in um, host app like DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro, and After Effects natively. So if you want to do color grading in, in Premiere Pro, for example, you don't need to have like a round trip um, workflow to another host app. You can just try it natively inside uh, Premiere Pro or After Effects in yes, that case. And we can mimic all the pro workflows with something that might feel a little bit more like semi-pro, something approachable, something that feels uh, the aesthetic is not so mathematic. So we'll talk about Colorista 5, guided color, color balance, and uh, the actual panel inside of Adobe Premiere. And then I hand it to Max, and Max will do Magic Bullet Looks. He'll cover stuff like Open Color I.O., Asus Color, creative looks and film emulations. And then we will reverse. Then we'll do, do the creative up front and then we'll switch over to the technical and I'll be able to uh, make it look technically sound after he does his Why not? flavor. Why not? So, so what we'll talk about, we'll do some storytelling. We're gonna showcase some of the stuff that we just shot just like a few days before coming here to IBC in Germany. And we'll be able to tell you a little bit about our project and show uh, some of our setups. And we'll do a practical example and show you step the guided color and show you how to do some, some creative looks and even make your own LUTs and uh, you know presets that you can carry on right. from one project to the next, editor to the colorist and back. So. Let's just showcase some of the clips in, and you can talk about this as long. Uh, yeah, this is actually a project that we shot in Germany right before IBC. It's a it's supposed to be a short film, but we haven't managed to cut it. It's not finished yet, and um, it's a story about a designer based in Frankfurt, Germany, and um, he just won a, a German German design award for his a uh, product, and it's like a modular product that can be um, used anywhere in the cityscape. And, you know, the, the, the big thing about this project, what we can use all the files for, which we'll have available to download either on a Demystifying series or on Maxi yeah. Color. So we'll you make can the file also available. have this footage available for download in 10-bit. So you can actually do some color grading awesome. and play around with the tools. But uh, the main thing about this is we had many different setups, different lighting, different cameras, different lenses. So this will... Uh, Give you a wide range of different stops of footage so that's some of our uh setups here and we also did some practical examples like using a fog machine for diffusion and then you can actually compare that to using magic bullet for fusion for, exactly for, and the benefit um, of using haze. the fog machine at some point if you keep wafting the haze uh wafting the fog it will it become haze and haze is like natural diffusions for your scene and you can create that inside the camera Yes. And what we actually um, try to do is that providing like different clips, one with haze and one without haze, so that later on, if you want to, you can download the clip and play around with it with Magic Bullet Suite to try the optical diffusion tool. And so when, whenever you're working with either log footage or maybe you come with, you have 709 footage, meaning it's already been transcoded to something that is a little bit more comfortable and basically the midpoint and the black plane are already set. You know, the difference is you can get to a good spot and you can, you can add that spice with looks and you don't necessarily have to come from straight out of the camera. So some people have access to the raw footage, 
and other people have access to a transcode that's provided by a post house. So we'll talk a little bit about both. So this is just a couple of the different setups that we have, a lot of slow-mo, a lot of uh, you know, different lighting setups, a lot of reflections, a lot of texture, stuff like that. And uh, we, we uh, ran through we ran through his tools and made him kind of burn down his tools all the way to the edge. So I think he over sharpened the tools definitely. a little bit. Yeah, definitely. definitely. And with that said, I'll make sure that, that we're not over sharpening our tools. So I'll, I'll kick this up and uh, Let's jump show in. the guided color correction. Right. So first thing I'm going to do, I have my scene here. Let me just step through the scene. This is kind of when he delivered the product that he was building while we were shooting. So this is what this scene is. And I'll just kind of step through it. He's just opening this modular bench that he made that's like a piece of art, but it's also a public uh, bench. So that, that could be locked up at night. Pretty yeah. interesting. So we have him just kind of doing the delivery for that. I'll just step through it real quick. And this is all in log. All right, so this is a 10-bit clip, 10-bit meaning you have this much more of a ceiling to work with when it comes to color. Uh, what a lot of people's phones shoot is usually 8-bit. Nowadays, it might be 10-bit, but uh, the difference is you have a little bit more headroom when you do color correction. And also, your skin tones look a little bit more accurate. So, let me just jump through here, and I'm going to just go clip by clip. Right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six clips here. I'm gonna start, I'll get it to a good balanced place with guided color correction, and then I'll hand it off to Max, but I'll walk this way so we don't have any feedback here, and you can come and tag in. So, uh, let me just zoom to this clip. We're in Adobe Premiere right now, and then I'm gonna go here to my effects, and you can just type in bullet, and that takes us to magic bullet. RG, Red Giant Magic Bullet, which is a part of Maxon. So I'll go here and I'm going to just add Colorista 5. And I just double clicked on it to add it. And then you'll see something that looks like this. Okay? And inside of here, I have all of this different uh, controls. But the good part about this, right, we can go here to extensions and you can actually have the full... Let me just do this. You can have this full panel just sitting there on a screen at all times and you don't have to add the effect to it. As soon as you push the sliders on any of your clips, it's gonna automatically add the effect to your clip. So this is basically like a standalone version without you having to go and search for the effect every single time. It's just available as its own panel. So and, it's also and by intelligent. The way, if you have a tangent panel, all the Magic Bullet Suite tools like Colorista and Looks can be also controlled using the tangent panels. So that's another advantage there. So another thing that you can do, as uh, if you go here into Sequence in the Sequence menu, you'll see uh, Selection Follows Playhead. So one thing that I really love about this panel, even the effect, is that you can see the clip that you're working on. So it'll say the name of the clip that you're working on as you're working on it. So let me just... Uh, get out of this full screen mode here. That's you'll particularly see. Um, very powerful if you have like a multi-monitor setup. So you can just put one panel on the one monitor, one for your editing, and one just for the reference monitor. So as we're stepping around, you'll see the number of that clip changes. So three, three, four, go forward, three, two, nine. So it, it pays attention to whichever clip that you're selecting. And then the second you make any adjustment inside of this panel, it applies the effect. So it makes life a little bit easier. So you can have this on a full screen uh, on your second screen, or why not? These days you can do like four, three or four 4K screens yeah. from a laptop. Thank you, Apple. <laughs> so, a uh, very powerful machine, yes. And Dell, and all the other PC brands. All right, so, and Lenovo, sorry. And Lenovo, <laughs> of course. Yeah. So if we go here, let me just step back a few. I have my scopes up here on the right hand side and I have them set to 10 bit. So I'll so, go here to the Colorista effect. And the uh, first thing I'm going to do, Tony, right? Before uh, we move forward, is anybody uh, like familiar with scope here? Probably like, um, let me just like walk you through a little bit. Um, 
exactly. Uh, um, scope is actually a representation of your image. It's laid out onto a 2D diagram. So your image is like plotted onto a diagram that goes from zero to 100. So the bottom part will be closing up to zero and then the highlight and like it will be like the, the, the brightest part, the topmost part. And as you can see, there's a separations of the red and green and blue channel as well. And there's many different ways that you can view your scopes. So that's one way that's in the application itself, but I'm going to show you a, a great way to cheat just in case you don't want to admit that you don't know how to read a scope, which is totally fine. Absolutely. All right. So there's this area right here before you even start. It's called guided color correction. And it just kind of takes you through a form and it will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So you don't have to dial it in numerically. So I'll go here, click on guided color correction. All right. And you get greeted by the screen. Now I'm going to click. And then here's a few things. Right now, there's a setting here for I don't know. I don't know what kind of footage it is. I was just handed a bunch of clips and I'm not a colorist. So I just want to go ahead and click I don't know. You can do that, but I'll take a step back and I'll show you a better way to do it if we understand what kind of camera it's coming from. Absolutely. So you also have the option to just a video where things are already set in place and basically your black point is already set. All right, so the floor is already set and you can expand it from there. If it was log, straight, coming straight from a camera. And then also, if it's video, but it's flat video. So it's kind of a generic flat profile. Like, for example, so you have if you're these using options. the Technicolor uh, cine, cine style um, profile, that would be like the, the, the type of the flat video. Or a lot of the times, if you work in a big post house, sometimes uh, the transcode will be just map to the flattest possible profile. Yeah. So you'll just be working with video that's flat and you don't even know what it was shown or worked on. So that's just what that would be. So let me take a step back here. I'm going to cancel this out. And now I'm going to go, and I know for a fact that this was shot with the Sony because we yeah. shot it. <laughs> so exactly. I'll go here and I'll go to where it says, choose a LUT. Now this is a technical LUT just to get you to a good spot. So then it kind of governs the way that the color is handled and it's gonna, it's gonna give you kind of a narrower uh, path. So I'm gonna go here, choose a LUT, and I already made it a favorite. You have a few different options inside of here. So you'll see there's some creative ones, but the one in particular that I'm using is this Sony LUT right here. So I'll choose that and I'm gonna just click apply. Now that I did that, you can already see that my footage has shifted a little bit. You can see some contrast in there. And then a lot of the times, if you're using a technical LUT, you know it came from that camera system, that might be what was used when, when uh, the cameraman was shooting. Okay, so we go in here. Now I'll go to guided color correction, hit continue. And then before it said flat video, log, right? And I don't know. Now it actually says the LUT that I chose will stick in there. So if you already just know which LUT that you're working with or, or which camera system that you're working with or color profile, now I can choose right in here. I knew that it was the Sony S-Log3. Now, here's the fun part. This is the part where you get to cheat, okay? This is a nice, easy form to fill out and it even gives you recommendations. And again, you can do it technically and then you can also leave a little bit of space so when you do start to do anything creative, you, can, you don't have something so high contrast. I can go here and just drag this down. And this right here, there's a little tick mark right here. If you can see, there's that little line. That little line is kind of the recommended area for where your black level will be. So I can drag it here. And let me just show you when you go beyond it. Because there's so much range, it takes a while before you see this. But if you look over here, it gets really cold, right? That means that I'm crushing all the black. So that means it's really hard shadows and it's very contrasty. So, what I want to do is kind of avoid, you don't want to have too much of that. So I'll just drag that back up and a little bit is fine, right? But that's the contrasty. If you want to see, right, that little blue area that's populated, that's okay to have just a little bit of that in there. You don't have to have, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect. So I'll go to the next, right? And I'm just really going to go down the line here and click these arrows. And then you're going to see the difference as we go down the line. At any point, if I say, oh, my image is a little too contrasty, I can actually go back by just clicking up here. 
and it'll tell you right here, this is where we adjusted the black level, this is where we adjusted the white level, and so on and so forth down the line. So yeah. if I wanted to, I can go back here and make a change or even reset. And just to add on top of that, once you're entering a guided color corrections, you probably see that, oh, why my image is now suddenly black and white. That's actually um, the software is just like putting the saturation down and then you can introduce that later at, uh, later on. The reason for that is that so you can separate um, the contrast level and then the color level on your clip. So you can just dial in the correct contrast without being affected by the color surrounded. So same thing with what we just did with the black levels, we could do with the white level. But watch, when I start to pull things beyond that line, you're going to notice now it becomes too hot. Now things are overexposed, right? Blue for cold and red for hot, right? So my image is a little too hot. And again, it's okay to have just a little, pe a little bit of peaking. If you look, there's just a little bit of peaking right there on the shoulder, and that's fine. Right? If you purposely want to push your image, you will see that there'll be a little bit of spike in your image, and that's fine. So we can tame it later on. So I'll leave it right here, and it's just beyond that level, and I'll start walking down the line here. So this is our midtones, the gray point, the middle part of your image, your gamma, right? So I'll take this down, and I'm just going to move this, and you'll see. So the recommended area is this set of mountains back here, right? So you can see all of this. This is what's recommended. If I want to, I can sit right about where it's recommended, right? But sometimes that's a little boring. Sometimes you just want to push it. So you can push it just beyond right here, right? Or you can go just under. It's the same thing why people will shoot just a hair underexposed or just a little bit overexposed. You want to give uh, a little bit more light to the highlights, or you want to show a little bit more of the low end. So it's the same idea, but in, in post. So I can go here, and now here's my contrast. How contrasty do I want this? This is where it's recommended. As you can see, as I'm dragging left, you're going to see that's the recommended area right over here. So I can fit this like a puzzle piece to match exactly what it recommends, or I can make it a little less contrasty, right? Or I can make it very contrasty, but I am a fan of making things a little less contrasty. Because you can right? still dial in later on. Absolutely. And what's nice with the guided color corrections is that nothing is destructive. It's not a baked in, uh, how do you call it, operations. Once you finish guide, guided color corrections, as Tony will show you later on, you can still tweak that um, the sliders, everything. Everything that I'm doing right here is going to turn into the, what's exactly inside of the panel. So it's going to do all the math for you, and then you have it available, so you can actually go in and dial back the saturation. You yeah. can go in and dial, dial in on the wheels here. So I'll show you that here in just a sec. So we go down the line. Now I've worked with the image all in black and white, kind of setting the lighting for it, and just kind of flushing out the shapes, right, without blowing out this or blowing out that, right? And now I'm going to add, here's my flavor, right? Here's that saturate. But just in case you don't know how to read the vector scope, you don't want all your color to go out to the outer part. You want to try to keep that contained. And especially if I know that I'm going to hand this off so it can get a little bit more flavor, I want to leave a little bit of headroom there so I don't necessarily have yeah. a super saturated image. And just okay. to add up, add up on top of that, uh, I think if you remember, Tony was using S-Log3 um, LUT. Uh, before starting the guided color corrections. So it means that all the adjustment will be done before the LUT. So the LUT will be applied right at the end, and it means like we are working under the LUT. Grading under the LUT. Grading under the LUT. Okay. So as far as saturation, you'll see here on my image as well. So I'll leave it like just below, and then I'll go one more over, and now we can set color balance. Is the shot too cool? Is it too warm? Do we want to warm it up? Do we want to cool it down? Do we want to tint it a little bit, right? If it's too green or if it's too magenta. So we can go here and let's just see, I'll cool it off. And then you can also see, here's another way to read the vector scope, right? As I'm dragging, look at everything shifting over here. This is where blue is. So I'm actually doing it and you're seeing a vector scope, you're just kind of getting a practical example of it but it's a little bit more easy to look at, right? So if I go here, that's cooling my image. 
See that? That's very stylized, and it makes everything look a little bit cold. But he's in a t-shirt, so I think we should probably warm it up. Exactly. Because I wouldn't want to be a t in a t-shirt if it's this cold outside. So I'll go here, and let me just boost this back, and I'll make it a little bit warm. I don't really want to, like, taint the image and make it too warm, but I just want it to be a little bit more warm than what it was. All right? And you can also use this little eyedropper right here to select what your neutral gray part of your image is. So if you have a gray card in the image or a chip chart, that's actually like really powerful. Yes. To just use the eyedropper to set the white balance. And if you look, there's a little drop down here so you can highlight where skin tone is. So you can set that as well. So you have the eyedropper for whatever your neutral gray is or whatever your skin tone is. Now I go down here and it shows me I went from this to that. And I did that just following along and just pictures and sliders. And it makes life a little bit easier. All right. So again, do you have to be a colorist? Not necessarily. It gets you to a good spot, not to take away from the colorist. No problem. But, you know, if you're an editor and you're on a time crunch and you have like 10 things to put together and your deadlines are ridiculous, this is one way to get you to a good spot. So I hit right here, finished. And as soon as I do that, that's applied to this clip. Right? And then everything inside of here, you'll see, let me just, and I can actually use the panel too for this. I'll just show you. This has been applied to that clip. And you'll see some different numbers. See how my temperature has changed? The saturation has changed. All these different sliders have been applied to that clip. And then beyond that, there's a few things that you can do. You can make this a preset. I wouldn't do it with something as specific as this, but if you shoot like a chip chart or something like that, and I'll show you an example of that, you can kind of dial in a setting. So if you always shoot in this room, you can have kind of a tone for the room that you can make as a preset and that you already apply to your footage. And then based on whoever's in the shot, whatever your subject is, whatever, then you can do the slight tweaks from there. And I'll show you that as well. So from here, we can choose a couple of different things. Um, there is, and it tells you right here, this is my second instance, right? I, I did this like a cooking show. I already had one prepared, but I wanted to do one from scratch to show you how this works. So you can actually run the effect more than one time and there's different things that you can do with it. You can use it to key items out and just select one color. You can use it to kind of just balance your shot and then add some flavor to it. Or you can use just one version of it and then it's a magic bullet exactly. looks. So in this version right here, I'm gonna leave it on V2. Right? That means the second instance, right? So if you look, I have it applied here and I turned it off and then I have it applied here. Okay? So that's the second instance of the effect that I applied to this clip. So that's what it means when it says V2. Now, if I go back here, let's just take a look at some of the stuff that I, that I dialed in when I did that. Also, if you feel like it's a little strong, you can turn the overall strength of the effect down. You know, I like to play around with that just in case I am going to add some flavor later on, I can make this 80. Now it's 80%. So if I did make it a little contrasty, but I like the overall idea of what I did, I just take the overall thing and kind of average it down so it's not so punchy. And so. when you are doing that, it's actually the transformations from a wide dynamic range of s log 3 into Rec. 709 will remain the same because the LUT, uh, the transformation slot is still in the full power. As you can see, the LUT strength is still on 100%, but you can still dial in the effect, the colorista effect. And what he means by the trans, I'm gonna play the editor role here. Yes, please. What he means by the, the transformation LUT is this Sony Log, uh, Log 3 that I have applied. Okay, so the technical LUT that got us to a good spot, that's what he's talking about with the transformation. It kind of makes the color shift the way that the manufacturer intended for that camera to look. Yeah. So in here, let's say I want to add some flavor to it and I'll dial this back in a second, but I'm just going to push the sliders just a little bit. So up here now I'm like, you know what? I think I want to make the, the overall image a little more warm and I'm just going to drag this out and drag it towards yellow and orange. And on the inside of this wheel right here, this is like targeting specific color. But on the outside of this wheel, this is my luminance, right? When it's all the way here where it's black, that's where you're like turning the lights off. When you crank it up here, all the way here, that's where, that's where 
you're getting more highlight, right? So you're getting your luminance values from that. So I can go and just go on the edge here and it separates it. So this is luminance. And then on the left side of that is saturation. So I can add more saturation to the midtone. So this is separating the shadow, the middle of your image, and then the highlights. So you can do each one of these wheels on there. So I'm gonna screw it up just a little bit and then I'll hand it over to you. No worry. After it's screwed up. No worry. I'll so, fix it. I'll go here and I'm just gonna push this a little bit. And you'll see some subtle uh, adjustment and I'll push it more until it starts to look a little crazy. Let me crunch that down. And now you can see I've made some adjustment to it. Let's say I like the way that this looks and then this is kind of approved by the producer or approved by the client. And they're like, that looks great. I like that shot. So you go to that shot and you can actually make and generate a LUT. And that might make some colorist cringe. Yeah. But the idea is this is a reference point that I'm printing out that you can hand off. And now you have a good spot to start. So uh, let's go here and I'll just click the button right here for a generate LUT. And you can make this, and right after this, I'll show preset right before I hand it off to you. Absolutely. I'll go here, and I can make a folder and call this, you know, this is where the LUTs are. And then I can say, like, approved, whatever, whatever we want to call it, approved outdoor. Right? Then I'll click generate. And if you read before you do this, it'll tell you that certain aspects are not included, like a vignette or something that's artistic, right? It's literally just dialing color and, ma and uh, doing math. So it's saying instead of this being red, it's more blue. Instead of being green, it's magenta. So it's changing the idea and it's doing the math. So it's recalibrating the color. That's all it's doing. It's not bringing any texture into it or anything else. It's not the magic one, one fix. So I'll click generate and that'll go into a folder which you can select it later on. I think I can actually even shoot the left after I've done that and see, there it is, approve outdoor. And it also lives in different parts of the Magic Bullet suite too. And you can also hand these off. There's a folder that's just a local folder on your hard drive that you can hand this off. So you can dial it in, type in whatever you want to type in. This is for this client, this is for that. This is my favorite, this is yours, whatever it is. And you can set that and save that. So, and hand it off and somebody else can uh, have that same uh, preset, right? Or LUT, sorry. Now, let's talk preset, okay? So if you're editing in Adobe Premiere, right? And you're using the Colorista effect versus if I was to go inside of Adobe After Effects. So if anybody's doing Cinema 4D, some of the stuff that we're talking about when we get to looks, you can actually do inside of Cinema 4D as well. But if anybody uses After Effects, you can take these presets to After Effects and this works inside of After Effects as well. So not just the video editing aspect, but also the motion graphics aspect and the 3D as well. So I'm gonna do the local preset inside of our host application in Adobe Premiere. I'm just gonna go right here, click, and I'll do a right click. And there's an option here for preset. And then in here, there's so many things that you can do uh, as far as instruction to make it easy so somebody says which one was the one that you used yesterday which is the one that i use for this you can type in everything in the description and you can also make it as easy as possible inside of the name that's the most important part that's how you prevent people from calling you at three o'clock in the morning because you're on a deadline and because they're on the night shift and you just left so uh in here colorista and i'll just call it like outdoor balance right and i'll save it and then here i can even say like shot with sony fx 6 or fx 9. now i hit okay and where does that live i'll go here to effects and then under presets and you'll see it lives right over here and then if you hover over it your description will pop up as well so it's one way to just keep things very simple so people don't call you and people don't ask you these questions. You make it so easy, but I promise you they'll probably still call you. Amazing. So yeah, idea of that is that this is inside of Premiere. This is Adobe's shortcut.
outside of that, you can go back to the Colorista effect and you can make your own presets from these as well by generating a lot or going here to save preset. And you can type that in as well. Now this lives inside of uh, the Maxon interface, right? Right. So basically with here, I can take this folder and I can give it to Max. Max can have it and we can work remote like we're doing at this very exactly. moment. Exactly. So I'm just going to approach you. Yeah. So um, me... while you're doing that, yep. let me just do my uh, part, the, the public service announcements ah, about yes. LUT. Um, probably like a lot of you guys probably work with LUT like very often, but sometimes you probably wonder what LUT is. LUT is just collections of numbers that transform the input uh, value of, of your image to, a, to the output value of your image. And um, there are several different type of LUT, four actually. The transformation LUT or the technical LUT that takes uh, footage from one specific um, flavor like S-Log Gamut, uh, S-Log 3 with a S-Gamut 3 into like Rec 709, for example. The one that transform, transform from one color space to the other color space, that's a transformation or a technical LUT. The other one would be like the creative LUT. It will stay normally in just one color space, preferably like the wide dynamic range color space like in, in ACES uh, AP1 or in DaVinci White Gamut. And it carries the, the look, but then it will not do the transformations. And the combinations of both will, call, will be called the hybrid LUT. And um, the stuff that Tony just created because he's baking in the transformation from Sony S-Log3 with some looks on top of it would be the hybrid LUT. And there is another one that you use for calibration, calibrating the screen, which is called the calibration LUT. And there is a huh. the whole different kind of LUT that you can use okay. in the market. I'm going to give it to you. One more thing about LUT though, I'm sorry, I cannot finish no speaking problem. about LUT, is that, you know, LUT, LUT is very LUT. Uh, strict. It, it needs a specific input and it will always give a specific output. So just be aware what type of footage that you're working with and um, what is the target. So oh. for example... Uh -huh. I was going to show you one more thing before. Yeah. So if you... I didn't want to step on you, go ahead, finish No problem, your man. I'm, 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 I'm finished. Okay, so... Let me show one thing. We'll just load up here. So where we are before I hand it to Max, everything has been balanced already, which can also be adjusted afterward. And you'll see how that mixes, All right? I'll just go to effect controls, twirl down colorista, right? And let me just apply looks. Like I was going to get into it, but now that's my handoff to him. And you'll see, there's another thing about looks that I want you to see and know. So. To apply the effect, by the way, if you're just highlighting a clip, you can look it up inside of the effects, little catalog area here, and just double click it. As long as you have a target for the clip, if that's selected, just double click it. You don't have to drag it on there. You can just double click it or drag it into the effect controls. So now I'm here in looks, and I'm going to go to effect controls, and I'll go to edit look. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit into no your problem. spot, and then I'll go here. And what this is doing here is giving me from scratch, but before I even do that, I'm gonna bring this. I'll do a little trick here so we can double up a little bit. Exactly. So I'm gonna select this, and this is just an Adobe Premiere thing. This is not necessarily about Magic Bullet looks. Before you prepare some of these, if you already like the flavor that you have, what thing you can do to kind of make this nice average scene, we're gonna add flavor to the whole scene, not clip by clip, right? So. I'll go here, there's an option for make subsequence. So you can collect your idea, and this is something I love to use all the time. You can go here and let's say I'm going to, I'll just show it to you on the timeline here. I'll select these clips, right? As I select clips, the shortcut is shift and the letter U, like uniform, right? And as soon as I do that, it actually will make, it makes this subsequence. Okay, which is basically only the things that I selected. When I double click, this is another way also, if you're an editor, this is another way to select anything anywhere on the timeline and you'll kind of make this, you'll preserve the edit that you've made and it'll get, it'll populate on another timeline. So it's not necessarily 
a nest, but it's a way to kind of preserve. It, it is a nest in one way, but in another way, it's basically I can select on three or four things, no matter where they are, and then they'll populate into another timeline. So before we even start, now we'll bring this back and I'll ma I will make this a nest so you can work. So I'll grab that and I'm going to replace this. And the two are not affected, which is great. So if I go here, it's still there. I've deleted it, right? So when you're doing client work and somebody doesn't like your beautiful idea, you can uh, do that again from scratch. And now I brought it all in as one single clip. Oh, you have to go in and actually turn on the effect on the others. But start on the first two, I guess. So that's one way to just preserve your edit so you can have access to your creative idea just in case a producer might tell you, oh, do this. Oh, can you do that thing you did before? No, I like it this way. Now you have it and now it's saved. Now it's somewhere else. Right. So now it's your turn. Right. Now let's have some fun creating <laughs> some good luck on one hour footage. So um, another thing is like, you know, in Magic Bullet Suite, um, there are plenty of good tools that you can play around to, to kind of like create some look on top of your um, image, for example. There are Magic Bullet Film, if you want to emulate the look of a film, and there is Magic Bullet Mojo. And sometimes the, the downfall when using this tool sometimes, not really a downfall, is that it looks so good, people just will leave it like, okay, I'll just leave it that way. And sometimes th this can make it's like, oh, I noticed that. Yep. And you don't want that. So, you know, adding would, it like sparingly is always is, like the... When, when the work is hard, it looks easy. And when, when uh, the work is terrible, it looks hard. Exactly. So uh, what I did is that I'm just drag and dropping Magic Bullet Mojo. It's like, you know, adding a little bit Mojo on your, on your image. Mag what Magic Bullet Mojo is doing is actually it takes all the warm highlight and mid-tone and push it toward the eye bar indicator or like the perfect skin tone in your waveform. That's actually um, this area. If we can show vector scope, I mean, um, there's a, oh, that's really tiny. You can hit, hit the, here, let me maximize. I'll maximize. Yeah, man. This over there. So, exactly. Um, what Magic Bullet Mojo is doing is actually it takes the mid-tone and highlights and pushing it to this eye bar, the, the line between the red skin and tone green. Line. That's the skin tone line. So it preserves the skin tone while pushing all the shadows and background color more towards, you guess what? Cyan. Unified color complementary. Complementary color, sorry. So what are we going to do next? Is that... Oh, if you need a tab out of that? Yeah, I got yeah, it. There you go. I got Perfect. it. Uh, let's go to Mojo. So first thing first is that since uh, we already did like the normalizations of the clip, it's now in video level. You have three different options that you can choose. You can tag if it's a video level or a flat clip or a lock clip. Means like you can still use Mojo on your S-Lock 3 clip, for example. But since we already did the accurate transformations using the s uh, S S log three. Yes. Uh, lot. <laughs> then we can use the video tag to to um, affect the control response. First is like how how much mojo effect is applied to the clip. Like if I, I crank this slider up, you'll see like the the shadow is getting bluer and the mid tone and highlights still remains in this warm um, area. So let's just refresh it and uh, and reset it into fifty. And um, what's nice here is that you have two different uh, sliders called glue squeeze and skin squeeze. That's actually literally um, the one that affecting the mojo slider the most. So if I squeeze or harmonize my blue, it means like more cool part of the image will be uh, uniform, will be unified. So if, for example, if I uh, do this and um, I try to affect the mojo, you'll see that more and more blue has the same hue. And same thing with skin squeeze. And by doing that, if you want to see if you are leaving the, the eye bar area, the perfect skin tone indica indicator, you have just, you, you really need to have a, you really need to just um, activate the show skin overlay. And by doing show skin overlay, you will see that uh, the orange grid means that that area under the orange grid 
is it's actually very, it's very it's subtle. Very subtle. Image, yeah. I think you can see you can around see, like, this little area. crosshairs on it. Yeah. just on the arm, and that's it, it. means that those highlight and mid tones are still on on the eye bar area. And what's nice with Mojo is that Mojo, you can take you can uh, you can try to understand Mojo like a what I like to say is like what I like to how do you call it say it is that Mojo is like MSG for your image. So if you use it like very much, it's then it, flav you, flavor you'll packet. notice it. Just so tear it open and just just use it just like sparingly. So like, like for example, maybe we'll just use twenty five percent, and you'll notice that. All right, I got like cooler shadow and I got um, warmer highlight, and you can still adjust the contrast. And to do that, you just you have the punch it, punch it slider to punch meaning, the meaning contrast. contrast. Exactly, and that is. That's how easy Mojo is. It just target your highlight, it target your um, shadow and try to unify that using the complementary color uh, theory. The other thing that you can use inside Magic Bullet Suite to create a um, nice effect is the Magic Bullet Film for sure. And Magic Bullet Film is like collections of like 22 different um, film negative and four different film print, right? I think who those of you that attend uh, yesterday's sessions, I think you know already what like film emulations. We talk about it, and um, these film stocks are actually um, emulated after was emulated were sampled after the best um, the best sample of film in the market available it's in the scientifically market. Scientifically dialed in. Yes. And technically so, for example, accurate. the Kodak fifty two nineteen Fission three five hundred T is actually a, a negative film that performed well in a in a in a um, in a low lighting situations because the film itself it has what it called the advanced dye layering technology so you get like slightly less um grain in the shadow area by using this um the film stocks and since it is a balance for a tungsten light so if you're using it on 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 the on a outdoor shot you got a several like different look than um, when you're using it, it for uh, in the indoor shoot, for example. And um, it has a very easy control that you can use, color temperature, co uh, tint, and exposure. These three controls are photometrically accurate because it's similar to like cranking gain in the linear color space. So for why, example- Why are you talking about that? Can yeah. I do one thing? I'm just gonna put the image on one screen. Yes. Because this, this right here will probably be a little bit easier to see. I'm going to try to put it mainly here and let me squeeze this down so you can see it on one screen so the color is not spread over three different screens in three separate color spaces. Right. Maybe the image might be smaller, but at least we can get the idea a little bit better this way. There you go. There you go. So um, that's another workflow that you can, um, uh, you can uh, follow. For example, balance it first with Colorista add film and add magic bullet mojo on top of that another workflow if you want to uh, to be more accurate is actually to work color manage and you can do that by using magic bullet looks for example so if i go to the other clip you just closed it <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll, I'll set it up you just close the program monitor okay no problem okay program there it is no, just close it. Yeah? Yeah. I'll minimize it. Right. There you go. You won't be able to see it here, though. So you're going to which clip? Yeah. You can go up and down here. Yeah, let me let me um, do magic bullet looks here. Okay. Just get out of this. Tilda. Yeah, let me see. All right. So... And let's go here. You want to apply looks to this? Yeah. Okay. Go into our effects and looks, double click it. And let me take it to the effects controls. And there you go. So yeah, now we're in looks. Thank you, Tony. You got um, it. New in, the, in, the, in, the, in this release is that um, you can now work in color management. Um, 
in the color managed workflow with Magic Bullet Looks because the new versions of Magic Bullet Looks is actually supporting um, ACES uh, through Open Color IO. Uh, so what I you can a, do is I that. A quick question for you. Yeah. Can you showcase one thing that I think is pretty amazing, whether you understand ACES or not? If you have a GoPro clip, if you have something that's shot with a cell phone, can you just show the ramp up between the 1D color space and the ACES? I'll do it later. I'll do it later. Um, we'll do that later. So what uh -huh. you what you what you Thank can you. do with ACES is that you can transform your image like accurately because you're not doing it based on your eyes. It's the math behind the workflow, behind the um, yeah, behind the framework is actually that uh, doing that. So you what you kind of do is that you can tag your image as Sony S Log3. And then just select the output that you prefer. Either it is a Rec 709 or whatever display that you are targeting. And just by doing that, and just by doing that and confirming it, you got like a, a like a neutral and transform um, how do you call it? A balanced image, like right after, um, right off the bat. And um, so by doing that, you, you already bypassed the, all the steps that you, you, you did before. Um, you can then create your look based on your preference. So for example, if you want to use just the film print without the film negative, you can just do, you can just drop in film print. And you know that film normally creates halations effect. And you can also do halations just by simply using the halation tool. Maybe select a several presets. And as you can see, the halations is actually the warm highlight between the high contrast area. And like what I told you before, you can just use the effect sparingly. And just by doing that, you can get your look like really fast so that's another uh tip uh for creating look in magic bullet uh looks so now let's go back to the other clip because i want to show you what's the difference using um for example if you're working mainly in uh, rec 709 that's the questions that are coming the most why do i need aces right because Actually, what ACES do is actually it is stripping all your color um, science, the image of your, your your image, and then putting it in a unified, in a in a very uniform uh, color space, huge, and it's even bigger than what uh, the, it, it, I mean. It contains all the primary more than what human eyes can see, and then you you start you kind of like working in that space, and then you can transform it into um, your display target, Rec 709 in this case. So let me check. Let me just dra drag and drop Magic Bullet looks in this case. Let me see. Wait a sec, man. Yeah. So let me just drag and drop Magic Bullet looks here. There you are. We're about five minutes out. So we are in um, Magic Bullet Looks. So for example, we have a image, which is in, uh, in Rec 709, and I can just tag that to Rec 709, and it's supposed to be same as input. And for example, if I am doing my exposure adjustment in Rec 709, if I just drag and drop the exposure tools, and I just drag the uh, drop the exposure by one stop you'll see that it drops like uniformly and um let's compare that when we're working with aces so i'll just take a reference image and just change the input the color handling uh, the color management into um aces so for example now now we have an image rec 709 image we throw it to aces big color space and then we port it to the um, Rec 709 display again. So if we are comparing the same adjustment, it's just one stop of exposure down. I think you may be you you may agree with me that you know doing the work inside Aces give you a better result rather than working a lot more in dynamic. a display display space. 
So that's it.